Up next, we're taking a look at Pulsar 2849 from Czech Games Editions, or CGE. All right, first off, to be transparent, I do have to say I did get a review copy of Pulsar after much begging at Origins 2019. This one, this one I had to fight for. Uh, Pulsar 2849 was designed by Vladimir Suchi and features art by Soren Mendig. It was published in North America by CGE in 2017. This sci-fi board game plays two to four players in an hour to two hours, really depending on the player count. To see what you get in a copy of Pulsar 2849, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. We'll be sure to drop a link to that in the show notes. Now, I'm not going to go through everything you get here. We stopped doing that. It just takes too long on the show. If you actually want to see it, watch the video or head over to the blog and read the blog version of this review. Now, what I will say is there's a ton of stuff in this box. It really is. It's a heavy box, a ton of cardboard, and it may be the game with the most individual boards I've ever seen for one game. This is a table hog. All the components are top-notch. The boards are nice and thick. The tiles and chits are great. Nice plastic individual player pieces. Uh, plastic instead of wood. Usually I prefer wood, but this, I don't know, it's a nice plastic. It's it's non-transparent. It's nice. Uh, what I did think was interesting is that the bits in here, especially the plastic bits, have been used from other games, other CGE games. Like, as soon as I open this box, I'm like, oh, those are the rocket ships that are from Galaxy Trucker. And, oh, that little, it looks like a blood drop. That's from Adrenaline. That's kind of cool. Uh, I'm sure the plastic discs are from some other game by them. And I don't mind that at all. You know what? Software reuse. It makes sense. You've already designed the component. Why not use it in multiple games? Absolutely. I think it's great for a company to do this. It makes a lot of sense for the bottom line, which helps us as consumers yeah. as well. Now, for our listeners out there that may be unfamiliar with Pulsar 2849, how do you play? All right. So this is a sci-fi, engine-building, dice-driven point salad. And due to that, it is not the easiest game to cover in a brief overview, but I'll try to do my best, at least give you an idea of how it's played. So it starts by setting up this massive board and all the sideboards around it. As I said, huge table hog. Some of the stuff is randomized, which technology boards are up, which HQ boards the players have, and some end game storing stuff. And there's a couple of additional decisions to make on which side of your player board to use. But what I'll say is that some of the boards are easier than others, and they do have a set for a first time player, which is a nice touch. Watching this game get set up is kind of shocking. It just keeps spreading out. Your game table at the at the Bellhop's house is a boardroom table. So yes. bigger than most. And it still felt like it was going to overflow the table and it was going to be cramped. Yeah, we're looking at four feet wide and it's, it's cutting it. It, it. it fits, but to be able to fit your own player boards and everything as well. Yeah. So to actually play the game, you're going to roll dice. It's a dice-driven game. You roll the dice and you put them on the dice board. You find the median die, and then the value marker is that's that blood drop is put to the left or right, depending on how many dice are above or below the median. Players are then going to draft two dice in player order. After drafting a die, you then have to move your marker on one of two tracks. The top track sets the player order for the next turn, not this one. And the bottom track represents your technological superiority versus the other players. What's neat is the player's markers move up or down, depending on which die you took. And this mechanic is a lot more fascinating than it sounds. This is one of the, the highlights of the game, actually. In general, you get rewarded for taking dice with low numbers and penalized for taking dice of high numbers, but it really varies based on where that center marker is. It really does actually sound more complex than it is, and I think most players can quickly grasp it upon seeing it. So it's really worth doing a quick roll and setup for this part yeah. of the game in the pre in the pregame teach. Yeah, set one up and then re-roll the dice once you start the actual game. Now, once everyone has their two dice, they're going to take turns. And every die you have lets you get one action, which means a max of two actions a turn in general. What you're going to use your dice for is to move your survey ship, your little thing on the map. You're going to discover systems and claim claiming colonies on those systems or claim pulsars. You can take a gyrodyne from the gyrodyne board. It's this little spinning thing. You can develop a pulsar that you already claimed with a gyrodyne. If you have a gyrodyne in play, you can spin it up, which is how you activate them. You just flip them over. Uh, you can bed, build an energy transmitter array. You can patent new technologies. You can buy a dice modifier token, or you can do a special project on your HQ board. Now, in addition to the, using the dice you drafted, there are many ways you can earn a bonus die during the turn. And this uses the red die that comes with the game. There's a bunch of silver dice and a red die. 
And if you can manage to do the right thing, you can claim a third bonus action, which is also taken from those same list of eight actions. So thematically, you are exploring the galaxy as a fa as your faction, trying to tap pulsars for energy for your group, world, faction, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then with that energy, you can advance your technology, gaining more energy, allowing your faction to do more things and essentially prosper over the others. So it's a it's a 3x game, essentially, where you're exploring and developing your technology in order to become the greatest civilization uh, over yeah. everyone else. Yeah, it's kind of like power grid in space in a way, which is kind of interesting. So after you've done your action phase, you've spent your dice, two dice and possibly a bonus die, you then do a production round where a number of things happen. You're going to receive knowledge cubes. That's based on that technology track. Those you can trade in for red dice or bonus actions. You can activate those transmission arrays you have that have activated may give you resources or points. Spun up gyro dines are going to score you points every round. Some technologies will give you points or other rewards. New technologies are locked every turn you get new ones available and the player orders updated based on that other track we talked about now the game only lasts eight rounds at the end of the eighth round after production there's a final scoring where you're going to get points for your claimed pulsars unactivated gyrodynes level three technologies the three end game scoring goals end game player order and how many settlements you founded during the game whoever has the most advanced and well-powered faction or you know group of wins now, I know, that's a huge info dump, and it's like that. When you're trying to teach the game, it's, it's like that. But to give you an idea of what you do, basically, you're going to fly your survey ship around the board, flip over systems, and you're going to get rewards for landing on them. You're going to claim pulsars, put those gyrodynes on them, and spin them up to start getting points every round, to start building your engine, your point engine. You're going to develop technologies to make that exploration and discovery easier and allow you to earn points by taking other actions. So you can get a technology that's going to give you extra points for exploring, or you can take a technology that'll give you extra points for spinning up gyrodynes, or a technology that'll give you extra points for taking technologies. The arrays are a totally separate thing, which can give you instant rewards or round-by-round -round resources if you choose to build them. Like I said, big point salad. There's lots of different things you can do and lots of different ways to get points. And what you do is off, often going to be driven by the randomized stuff at the start of the game, the end game goals and which technologies are up during the game. So while not a 4X game, this does have a very strong feeling in that direction and is really just missing that fourth X, which we know from other games that some people don't enjoy anyway. So yeah. if you do like your battles in games, there may still be enough meat in this game without those to make you forget that you're not conquering other people along the way because you've got too much other things to worry about. Yeah. While there is a lot of direct player interaction, it's all, uh, sorry, indirect player action. So it's all, you took the die I wanted, or you got to the system I wanted to get to first. It's more of the, or you got higher on the track. So yes, you're interacting with each other, but there's no attacking, there's no stealing resource from another player. But man, is it frustrated when the other player takes that two that you really needed. Now, I'm a huge fan of action collection games. I love engine builders, and I'm a Feld fan, so I love my point salads. And Pulsar has all three of those elements. And what it adds to those tried-and-true mechanics is a really interesting dice drafting mechanic. The main thing you have to worry about when adding dice to any game is too much randomness. And I've never found that problem with Pulsar. And that's because it uses input randomness instead of output randomness. So dice are rolled. You look at the results of the dice, and then you use those to plan your turn. This is compared to an output randomness game where you go, I'm going to do this and roll the dice to see if it works. That's your difference. While rolls of the dice do matter, I've never felt like I was stuck or my turn was ruined by a die roll. Sure, I might not be able to do that thing I was really hoping to do, but there's always other options. Like I said, each die can be used for eight different things. Added to this, there is the fact you can buy dice modifier tokens, which help you mitigate that randomness. There's a plus two and there's a plus minus one. Plus, there's the whole bonus die rules where you can try to earn that third action. So if there's a number you really need, there's usually some way to get to it. Maybe not right when you want to, but eventually. The variety of play options is really the thing that makes this game for me. The number of strategies available is huge. And that's what's really the mitigating that those dice randomness. You're never without an option. It may not be your first choice, but choices three through seven are still there. Very fair. Now, the one people 
thing that people may not like about Pulsar is how limiting it is only having two base actions a turn. Like every great Euro game, you can't do everything you want. It's It wouldn't be a fun game if you could do everything you want. But on Pulsar, you can't even do most of what you want. You won't be able to do half of what you want. You won't even be able to do the majority of what you want. This is, in my opinion, one of the most restricting Euro games I've ever played, where you are just so limited by your number of actions. If you don't earn those red dice, you are literally looking at 16 turns the whole game, and it's over. There are eight different options you get. Each die you spend each turn, I can promise you're going to only want to do five of those eight different things, and the decision of which of those five can be agonizing. Yeah, there's a saying that limitation breeds creativity, and I think there's a lot of that in this game. It forces you to focus and narrow your plans to work and try for the most efficient path to your goal, given the choices made already and the actions available mm -hmm. right now. Now, one thing that I really like about this game is that it helps beginners in some ways, because the people who have played this game a dozen times may know the best path to get somewhere. They can't always take it. Yep. And so your choices are just as valid as theirs, even though you don't necessarily know <laughs> what the best options might be. Fair, fair assessment. Now, another big part of this game is the fact that we get those two actions. So a big part of it is to fight to get more. Now, there are some technologies that will give you an extra action. The main way to do it is to earn that red die, and that becomes a fight, is how can I earn that red die every turn? Because having one extra action is a huge thing in this game. Either fighting to collect knowledge cubes you can trade in, or fighting over the right arrays, because when you flip two arrays, you get a bonus die, or using the spots on your HQ that give you a die at the right time is that one extra thing. And, and planning that out, I find very rewarding. Solving that puzzle going, I need a five, there's no fives rolled, how can I get a red five this turn? And managing to pull it off, I love. Now, the other complaint, besides the constraining restrictions, and again, that's not a complaint to me, but people may not like that, is the fact, and Sean will attest to this, this is not easy to teach or learn. It's the onboarding required. Because of those eight different actions, you need to know what they are all for instead of just what to do with them, right? So first I got to teach you eight different things you can use these dice for, and then there's all these icons that are on the board, and then it's the why, right? Sure, I can buy a gyro die, but why do I want to buy a gyro die? Or here's a bunch of technologies that modify your basic actions. Well, which technology do I want? What's the good one? And there isn't really an answer to that. Now, I've said in the past that I do, and pardon the pun, gravitate towards sci-fi games. <laughs> and so I feel like I picked this one up pretty quickly. But there's no question I didn't grasp all of the options in my first play. And I think this is a really strong candidate for teaching by doing and explain while setting up everything. Because again, we talked about how big this is and how much there is to set up. So we explain through that already time-consuming process. Then play two rounds mm -hmm. and see where everyone's at. And maybe everyone's feeling like, oh, okay, I'm sort of getting this. Let's keep going. Or... Reboot, start fresh, yeah. and learn from the mistakes you made. Again, it's only eight turns total, so it's not that big a deal if you play two and restart. Yep, fair. What I have found interesting, though, is those first two turns, a little rough, but then people tend to pick it up really quickly, like not just you. There's something intuitive about it, something about the actions you're taking and why you take them, right? So uh, the pulsars in particular. So first, I got to fly to a pulsar to claim it. I put a ring on it. I now have it. Well, what do I want to do next? Well, I want to put a gyro dine in. So I'm going to earn a gyro dine. I'm going to put it in the ring. Then I want to get a die to flip that gyro dine over to start earning points. And that all just makes sense thematically as well as mechanically. Like it just, it, it works, right? Like the whole point of the game, spin up these pulsars to start generating points and send energy back to your home faction. And I think that was was a big part of it that just it, it's almost intuitive that oh that, of course i'd want to do that for this reason and i think you found that as well absolutely the sooner you can get past the overwhelming nature of the number of options and, and the limitation of those options they have linked the theme and the mechanics very well and that is what helps it flow for a new player if when you mm -hmm. when you've got that that match between mechanics and and concepts now, I played Pulsar at all player counts. It's uh, two to four. And the only thing that really seems to change is playing time. I was actually really surprised by how well it played with only two players. 
It's just as tight and rewarding and plays in about an hour, which is ridiculously quick. And to be honest, the biggest complaint I had about playing two player was how long it took to set up and put away <laughs> compared to how long it actually took to play. Now I will admit with four players, there can be some downtime. Uh, this can be a very AP heavy game, but I didn't mind it because it was a hot, heavy AP game while everyone else was taking a long time, just gave me more time to think myself. So I never found very often my turn was planned out. And I was sitting back waiting. It was, okay, please take as long as you want because I still haven't figured out what I'm going to do. Yeah, I, I really do hope someone does an online version of this one because I think it could really soar implemented yeah. well and it would mean that I get to play it more often. So <laughs> Very true. Yeah, we have to go look for that. I haven't noticed it on any of the say It wasn't on any of the three sites we talked about earlier during this episode. Overall, I dig it. I, I like Pulsar 2849 a lot. Uh combines a lot of mechanics that I enjoy all in one game. Uh, while it can be frustrating that I can't do all the things I want to do or half the things I want to do, I know my opponents are in the same boat, and it's up to me to find the best thing to do with the options I have. It may not be easy to teach, but I got to admit, it's one of those ones that people pick it up quickly once they get over that intimidation factor. The, the front load on this game can be a bit rough. Yeah. If you are into sci-fi Euros, just pick this game up. Like, I honestly, I highly doubt you're going to be disappointed if, if you're a Euro fan. Now, if you like engine buildings and point salads and dice drafting or action selection games, well, whether sci-fi or not, you might want to check this out. But if you prefer lighter games, and if you don't like, especially if you don't like heavy, difficult decisions, where it's I have eight options and I've got to min-max in my head those eight options to figure out the best, if that's not your idea of fun, if you'd rather look at three cards and pass or go, right, this isn't going to be the game for you. If you don't like having to, to that whole engine optimization, you're not going to enjoy Pulsar. It's definitely heavier weight than you'd be interested. Yeah, and for those uh, who are craving that fourth X, if you need to have that interplayer conflict, again, this one doesn't have that, so no. be warned in advance. Now, for a more in-depth look at Pulsar 2849, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews.